talking about public policy, public policy needs multiple dimensions. When we are talking about, say, for example, you are a machine learning person. Today in machine learning, there are so many of debates which are happening surrounding fairness of machine learning. How can you bring reliability in predictions of machine learning? For example, uh, somebody goes to a bank, the algorithm at the back end says that he is eligible for the loan. But mostly anybody who is really serious and is looking for people who are seriously engaged in it, they'll not be able to give you anything important. So if you're looking for just having a stint in an organization, you may approach to any any faculty member who are there. But somebody who is very serious, somebody who is very reputed, they'll not look for short-term internship opportunities. They'll not have related to, you know, computer vision, related to Internet of Things. Uh, using this tech, what they're trying to do is they are trying to facilitate smarter agriculture management. So things like, for example, in Punjab side and in Northern India, this is quite a bit of problem due to, during the, you know, October, November months of the year. Uh, what happens is you, after the crop has been, you know, kind of the wheat has been removed. It could be something like how users interact with a technological platform, uh, which could be something like a chatbot. It could be something like uh, a platform like, say, Ola or Uber, or it could be some other technological platforms like social media. So when people are users or users are interacting with these platforms, uh, maybe they are also sharing their perspectives of engagement interaction. But if a person demonstrates that at the postgraduate level, the person has been really working hard, there has to be some evidences of that, that he is serious. It might have been, happened that due to many family circumstances, due to other circumstances, a person could not crack into the top colleges at the undergrad level. But then at the master's level, he had that opportunity. So he should have been serious at that point of time in terms of grades, in terms of maybe doing some small research project which brought out something tangible. Hello students, welcome to another podcast session. We have a very special guest with us today. But before we delve into the insightful conversation ahead, let me provide you with a brief overview of his research works and its impact on real world applications. In today's digital world, companies strive to enhance user experience while visiting their websites or apps. This is where AI or smart computer programs comes into play, okay? This is also known as user mining experience, you know, that incorporate features such as behavioral analysis, where AI algorithms analyze user behavior patterns by processing vast amount of data generated during their interactions, okay? Sentiment analysis. This is another feature that allows AI to understand user feelings by examining comments or, or their feedback online they are giving. Moreover, AI can predict user next actions based on their previous interactions, ensuring companies understand their preferences and continually improve user online surf experience. You can say this in layman terms, AI acts here as a helpful assistant, making user online experiences more enjoyable, personalized and hassle-free. It is all about making uh, things work better for all of us. Now, in this context, there is another pivotal point of concern is the delicate issue of human privacy and identity with a specific focus on generative AI. I think you all have heard about generative AI, right? It's in simple terms refers to an AI systems that can create new content like images, text on their own. While this capability opens exciting possibilities, it also raises serious concerns about privacy and identity, okay? Let's imagine if someone could misuse generative AI to create fake content that might harm individuals or it can even spread misinformation. So, long story short, fairness in machine learning is critical consideration and reliability in prediction is a paramount concern. That is, an ideal AI model are expected to not only make accurate predictions but 
also maintain their reliability over time which becomes particularly challenging in a dynamic environments where training data is constantly evolving so we are also going to have a brief discussions about fairness in machine learning and i hope that you can extract meaningful insights from our guests perspectives which will provide valuable perspectives on the intersections of technology and governance okay so without any further ado let's begin our today thank you professor for being with us today we are looking forward to some insightful discussions so to start with uh, can you tell us a bit about your academic journey starting from jadavpur university then you worked at uh, ibm research before becoming an assistant professor at iit delhi so how was the experience and uh, what you have learned along the way thank you thank you first of all ayun for inviting me here today it is really a great pleasure to have this interaction so uh, i started my journey uh, you know Uh, when i was uh, doing my btech in jadavpur university i was still meddling with computers then um and at that point of time my entire focus was initially that i'll be joining into the it services company and then subsequently i went on uh, you know i was doing multiple of these interview process so the first job that i got was in tcs uh, like like almost everybody who sits for placement tcs was the first company to come on campus and probably in that batch you know we had 300 people selected in tcs from jadavpur and then subsequently you know i was exploring opportunities i had discussions with pwc and got an offer from there and i was having some discussions with another organization which was a more technical organization technical product development organization when i basically got my you know opportunity uh, at that point of time to do my fm in xlri so then uh, i did not continue on the job side i joined xlri to do my uh, fm and that was when i initially had you know at that opportunity to work in the, as an internship and then that continued for a little bit more uh when i started working with ipm research and then subsequently once i finished my fm uh, my fm thesis area was related to uh, you know doing mathematical models for e procurement which has nothing relevant to what kind of work i do these days but that was what my doctoral journey was all about i chose that e research area because i had another senior who was doing his fpm who just completed his fpm then from xlri under my supervisor uh, prof sashish pani was my supervisor from my xlri days so under him there was another senior amit agrahari who had completed his fpm he chose e procurement and so i chose e procurement not because of any other reason but uh, because there is somebody else whom i could see that he is walking down a trodden path so i took that trodden path and that's how like i finished my doctoral journey and then su- subsequently after that i started working again in the corporate uh, of course a brief stint in ibm research then brief stint in cognizant consulting uh, consulting i did not uh, i mean when i joined there I was very excited because when I was doing my FPM, I was very sure I'd not join the academia. Uh, I wanted to be in the corporate, but then when I joined Cognizant, I realized that a lot of people who are already working there, who are very senior to me, designation-wise, because I joined as an associate consultant, then I, I mean, then in Cognizant, I became a consultant. But there were people who were at the level of associate director, senior director, who were all keen to look for a PhD and thinking of something. that should be a second lifeline so they were keen to get out of the system and at that point of time i realized that suddenly i got this couple of you know opportunities and interaction and uh, interview calls and the first interview call uh, and the first offer that was given to me was from i am rotak when i got that opportunity from i am rotak i also got similarly calls from i am kozikod at that point of time but that was just after i had joined i am rotak but because i had already joined i am rotak so i continued there for 2 years and after that i basically switched to iit delhi as an assistant professor so that was my you know this was my fourth job so i joined iit delhi and in iit delhi i basically started focusing on different areas of research i joined the 
when i joined here there was two you know areas that i had jointly been given the offer from one was information systems the other were telecom systems so initially i started with a lot of focus on telecom related teaching courses as well but then slowly slowly i moved to complete information systems now uh, in iit delhi i then subsequently became a joint faculty with the school of artificial intelligence in couple of years but fundamentally like i am more of a code information systems person now so uh, early days i used to shuffle between uh, telecom computer science but more and more now i'm focusing on the information systems related research so my scholars who are there they're working on different areas of information systems different slices but broadly it will be always related to the adoption the user experience of how people use technologies emerging technologies so do you think that your job experience has give some advantage on your present work i mean is there any connections do you found not really because see uh, if i considered ibm research i could understand uh, i could understand a lot more it artifacts which were very advanced in those days but if i think of cognizant uh, i won't say that it is helpful for me in terms of my uh, in terms of my research per se but i'll say that its job experience is very useful when i go to the class to teach so when i'm talking about the way that people talk about technology understand organizational structure understand very simple things like horizontals verticals how organizations work how reporting systems work how simple things like maybe uh, erp systems like people software so those are very very elementary things in the industry but those elementary things one has to understand and one has to know which possibly is not feasible if you are purely in an academic system so my couple of years here and there you know two three years here and there in uh, the industry they basically helped me to understand those very very basic elementary things then subsequently it was more about purely focusing on academia building up my research portfolio ensuring that i have a strong pipeline of publications over a period of years so what gave me credence in the class was basically some elements of the corporate exposure what gave me credence in the academic world was basically my research publication let us now discuss about your research so ai for mining user experiences starting with this topic first that uh, how does ai contribute to improve user experiences and uh, what are the main challenges and opportunities involved in this cases if you could share about these things so i'll i'll talk about little bit about the kind of research we do uh so it is slightly different from a person who is maybe in a computer science department or core you know cs department where he will be exploring about algorithmic contributions so he will probably be if he is a person working on nlp he will probably try to build nlp you know kind of models maybe build an encoder or a decoder so we don't work in that that kind of space that we are trying to build an encoder or decoder what we try to do is uh, we try to kind of uh, build models which will be theoretical models for explaining how users interact with the technology it could be something like how users interact with the technological platform uh, which could be something like a chatbot it could be something like uh, a platform like say ola or uber or it could be some other technological platforms like social media so when people are users or users are interacting with these platforms uh, maybe they are also sharing their perspectives of engagement interaction sometimes say i use a mobile phone i use a say payment app i had a problem in the payment app and i did not really like that user experience so i tweet about that so when i tweet about mentioning that this is something i did not like about cptm or upi some other app now what happens is that trace data remains so on a real time basis when these trace data is mined whether it is through platforms like um, you know uh, twitter platforms like reddit platforms like facebook there is a lot of information that we are able to collect from these you know messages so on the basis of the information that we are collecting from these messages it is possible to do things like after cleaning the data of course the standard practices of 
lemmatization, stemming, and all those things are there. But after you clean the data, then you start doing some kind of topic summarization or topic modeling. And then we are able to identify themes. So themes could be related to some way of explaining how the user experience for this particular type of technology services would have been better. The technology services could be a chatbot, could be something like, say, tourism, could be something like um, mobile payment, could be something like uh, design of any kind of user interaction on the social media platforms, or could be even related to maybe how campaigns are being perceived on social media platform. How, what is the role of misinformation? What is the role of uh, different elements in the campaign? Maybe the images which are there. So I try to basically, I or when I say I, basically my team, my scholars basically would try to mine these signals. And after they mine the signals, they would try to kind of build and theorize about how people who are interacting or, you know, kind of using these platforms, how their user experiences can be made better over a period of time. So we build causal models, but the theory building is mainly, it is social sciences. Uh, we try to build theories in social sciences, but uh, which will come from maybe marketing literature, may come from information systems literature, most of it from information systems literature only. And then we try to explain that, okay, how can we improve user experiences better? How can we improve how people will, you know, promote certain established technologies better? So that is predominantly our focus area. You have your work on this, which has been published on Howard Business School, that nurture from sustainable agriculture management through smart information technologies. So, could if you could briefly discuss about uh, uh, what is the impact of the paper and uh, what are the main motivations of this work? So, that is thanks for bringing that out. That's a case study. That's not really a research paper. So what happens is sometimes we write research paper and the audience is other researchers, basically academics or people who are working in research lab. So when we write these case studies, the audience is basically students who are kind of studying their masters in business administration or they are practitioners who want to upskill their knowledge about an area. So in this case study, what we tried to explore was this company nurture.farm. Uh, they are into, you know, using a lot more tech tech related to, you know, computer vision related to Internet of Things. Uh, using this tech, what they're trying to do is they are trying to facilitate smarter agriculture management. So things like, for example, in Punjab side and in Northern India, this is quite a bit of problem due to during the, you know, October, November months of the year. Uh, what happens is you, after the crop has been, you know, kind of the wheat has been removed, dehusked. Then what happens? What do you do with the remaining plants? So what happens is you start burning those, you know, the stubble, you start burning those crops, which are removed of the wheat fields. But after that, you start burning them so that the field gets, you know, kind of ready for the subsequent round. So what happens when the field gets ready? The paddy, you can again sow the wheat, or you can again sow the grain for the sec in the next round uh, before the winter hits in which is basically for the Kharif kind of circle. So what you try to do is you would try to kind of uh, burn off the crops and prepare the field. Now that creates huge amount of pollution. So this company had created, see, a mechanism of, uh, you know, bacterial solutions, some chemicals, emulsifiers, which will enable the crops not to be, which need not need the crops to be burned. You just spray it across the field and the crops start decaying faster. And then they become organic and enriches the soil much more. So you don't need to burn the crop, which adds to the pollution. So using this kind of technologies, this firm basically had brought out a way to address this agricultural thing more sustainably. Then other things like uh, use of IoT, like when in a particular region of the soil, there is too much of water, you can stop the water automatically or detecting like there is too much of pH value, uh, high pH or low pH. So you need to, prob most of the time, the soil should be slightly having a acidic content. So uh, understanding when the soil is too much basic, maybe too much of leaching has happened. So you need to add, uh, take corrective actions. So those kind of sensors in the agriculture, understanding like when it is needed to automatically switch on the 
watering systems. So those kind of mechanisms using uh, some of the very basic elementary technologies, but then implementing them in a grassroots level, this was what the company has done. So we discussed main, mainly about how this company has been trying to, you know, kind of um, showcasing how tech can be used in agriculture. And we developed this case study with an MBA student. So when we developed this case study with the MBA student, we basically approached the firm, took a lot of interviews, and then we tried to develop this case. And incidentally, when we wrote this, we never knew, like we targeted, of course, to publish it, but then one doesn't really know about the audience till it is actually being sent. So when we sent it out, then what happened was uh, we got an email from IV uh, that it has been sent for Financial Times for, uh, you know, a potential award, uh, which will be decided sometimes in January only, January or February. And there were five cases which have been shortlisted for that. So if it makes it, that will be a very prestigious award because typically every year, I'd say thousands of cases get written. So even being in the top five for, you know, one case study, that is something very exciting for me. But finally, if we get the award, that will be, you know, one out of thousand. So let's see what happens on that front. Okay. It's really a very prestigious and it's really thanks for bringing this case study in front of the world. So in the realm of data science and uh, digital transformations, how do you uh, envision these technologies impacting and shaping public policy, especially in the field of ICT? Yeah, this area is very large. So what is happening is today when we are talking about public policy, public policy has different focus. For example, recently there has been so much of news surrounding how uh, technologies like generative AI is going to be governed. So, for example, uh, from the uh, Commonwealth, they have constituted a you know court committee which will try to bring out governance-related, policy-related documents surrounding how this you know, generative AI is going to be governed. What should be attributes of ensuring that generative AI, uh, how organizations are going to harness it, how countries are going to harness it, it should not have too much of adverse impacts. So for public policy elements of new technologies are something that is a pretty classic area. Uh, I started venturing into that area when we started exploring areas like e-governance, which is classically the area of public policy, but looking at how service delivery is provisioned from countries to its citizens. Now, there have been other areas of research in the past, like smart cities. So we did a lot of conferences brought out edited books in smart cities. And those have really been been kind of the background training on which I've been building up. And today when we are talking about public policy, public policy needs multiple dimensions. When we're talking about, say, for example, you're a machine learning person, today in machine learning, there are so many of debates which are happening surrounding fairness of machine learning. How can you bring reliability in predictions of machine learning? For example, uh, somebody goes to a bank the algorithm at the back end says that he is eligible for the loan. Now, the same person or somebody very similar to him walks into the bank and that person says that he is not eligible for the loan. Maybe their variable or the data is same, but just because there is no reliability in terms of many of the models, because the training data is also kind of changing, sometimes the sample of the training data affects the outcome. So those kind of challenges are there in terms of transparency of AI, explainability of AI, fairness of AI, what kind of data representations are there in the sample that affects the biases. So, for example, if I have most of my sample based out of, um, say, white male, uh, you know, respondents or white male sample, then can I, can I also have similar inferences made for maybe Asian, South Asian or Global South Asian uh, say male sample or even more extreme maybe if my sample is all about men can it also generalize or inferences can be built for women so those kind of recommendation challenges are often there when we're talking about ai so feet related explainability transparency reliability fairness those have been often been debated for ai and today when we're talking about generative ai many of these things also comes into the picture then there are additional things. Uh, when people are using generative AI, do their cognitive skills get impacted? 
how would employability be affected for people who are not doing you know very knowledge intensive work in organization so when organizations start adopting generative ai is there going to be a challenge in terms of employability of certain communities or certain kinds of workers so there is a lot of public policy and deliberation surrounding this that some of us are have started dabbling with okay thanks for uh, sharing such an insightful discussions about your research so could you now share details about your ongoing projects and uh, if there is any vacancies positions available for interns and for phd or postdoc researchers so for my ongoing projects typically like what happens is i work mostly on research projects and what happens on research projects is it, there is a very long duration of time of commitment that is needed so what happens is most of the time i mean i get a lot of internship request but typically a research project would require 2 3 years of commitment so one year for actually you know kind of engaging on the project one to one and half years to convert it into a decent manuscript and then the publication cycle typically takes another one to two years even if the work done is really good the review cycle is typically you know one to one and half years so from the date of engagement a person needs to have at least 3 years of commitment to convert something tangible now what happens is most of the time what interns typically look for they look for 2 3 months 5 months 6 months kind of engagement which typically is not feasible at my side i do a lot of sponsored projects sometimes and in the sponsored projects i hire postdocs like uh, there is one ongoing project uh, with a company called bsr uh, we hired a postdoc in that but the postdoc was there for a very short duration but the remaining parts of the delivery of that project was basically handled by you know um, one of our phd school you know scholars so i am looking for more people who are excited about really doing pushing hard for phd so every year i will typically take one phd scholar for you know undertaking research and the kind of skills i'm looking for like for example i'm going to advertise uh, one uh, phd position in fact couple of phd positions in the space of misinformation so how do you detect misinformation how do you use uh, you know different ml models for detecting misinformation so i'm going to you know kind of have couple of projects like that and these projects would be in association with university of queensland in australia and iit delhi so we are planning out to build up you know a kind of uh, ml models and it will be ml based but again we are trying to contribute back in the theory of trying to understand how misinformation percolates in social media how misinformation slowly gradually you know one is growth of misinformation see there is a particular fake news the other is how it starts you know trickling down and decays so we're looking at both these aspects of how misinformation can be detected which is a more of deep learning kind of application and then subsequently we are also trying to theorize about how misinformation growth and decay can happen in social media what attributes of misinformation helps in the you know decay so those are some of the research areas that i'm looking to hire phd scholars uh, in the under the uh, university of queensland and iit delhi mou where the phd scholars get a joint degree both from university of queensland and from also iit delhi besides that my regular you know if somebody has got a good publication background uh, and is interested to do a phd the minimum thing that i look for if somebody is a mtech or if somebody has a mba after their btech I, i expect that somebody would have a btech and then try to go for an mba or an mtech before they come for a phd and that kind of a person would typically have some degree of understanding of how to do coding in python little bit of background understanding of nlp so that they can mine trace data they can mine and they have a little bit of analytical skills because any kind of validation i don't work much on qualitative research methods but uh, mostly my approaches are a little bit technical and quantitative so for that having a background of you know engineering helps most of the time so is there any specific background you are looking for or any person of different background i mean not so familiar with computer science and all those kind of things is also uh, is is also applicable so a person who is not from computer science is also fine but then the person should have had some background in terms of 
running ML models. They should understand a little bit of, for example, algorithmic elements. So somebody who understands, say, data structure, somebody who knows how to do a little bit of programming in Python, it should not happen that somebody comes into the system and then completely gets stuck up into implementing simple Python packages and then subsequently understand a little bit of Keras, PyTorch, those kind of packages. So they should be somewhat having familiarity with that. Uh, not always the background needs to be from IT computer science or electronics. There can be people from other disciplines as well as, as well, but uh, they need to have some degree of familiarity. Uh, the other side that I'm looking at is it's not only a pure CS PhD. So I'm not looking for people who will contribute into the computer science discipline, but what I'm looking for is people who would be able to understand how these methods of using these algorithms will be useful for theorizing about human behavior. So they also need to understand some element of human behavior. So an ideal person would have a BTEC in computer science from a decent place, good grades, understand CS well, and then has a good you know, pedigree from a good MBA school. So then he will be able to understand how these two things will interface. So it is basically a combination of computer science and human psychology. Yes. Somebody who understands psychology, a lot of time what happens is people from a POCS background will not be able to appreciate psychological elements. Because when we talk of management theories, most of the management theories are basically behavioral theories. So a person needs to understand the psychology, the behavioral theories, and then use the computer science methods, algorithms to bring out findings and explain those findings that connect with behavioral theories. So a combination of behavioral theory and computer science is the kind of skill set that I'm looking for in most of my projects. So as we approach the conclusion of our discussions today, I would uh, like to pose a final question. Typically, I ask this to all of my podcast guests that uh, if you could offer any important piece of advices for junior researchers, whether they are working as an intern or thinking, I mean, as a potential PhD researchers. Uh, so what would the advice that you'd like to give them? One of the biggest challenges these days is a lot of BTEC students, when they are undertaking the BTEC, they just want to have a stint to show as an internship. So sometimes you may get that stint. But mostly anybody who is really serious and is looking for people who are seriously engaged in it, they'll not be able to give you anything important. So if you're looking for just having a stint in an organization, you may approach to any any faculty member who are there. But somebody who is very serious, somebody who is very reputed, they'll not look for short-term internship opportunities. They'll not have short-term internship opportunities. With them, if you have to work, then it has to be long-term commitment that you are going for. Now, the problem is at the BTEC level, students would also not be trained. So long-term engagement basically needs them to also put in huge amount of effort in a very different discipline to understand the nuances so that they can do some research. And research means it's basically swimming around the ocean. Whoever is the mentor, he can basically do corrective actions, but he will not be able to tell you that these are the small, small steps. That kind of handholding doesn't happen in research. But if you're looking for something like an MS, I would suggest that people should try to invest that two, three years to understand what that journey entails. Because I see a lot of people who are keen to do an MS outside India, then you should try to seriously try uh, joining in research projects to develop some kind of documents, some publications that you can demonstrate. Like in the past, there has been, I mean, I'm open towards mentoring some some of the younger kids. There have been students who have worked with me during the school days also. They published their findings and they went on to their, you know, do their undergraduation. The, you know, they went on to do their undergraduation in Caltech, uh, then Oxford University, BTEC in computer science. Now, but these are very, very rare. The commitment that they demonstrated was very, very rare and some of them went on to do their Caltech, MIT and uh, Oxford. They were the three kids. But most of the time when I started interacting with many others, 
it was very evident that they just want something on their resume to write that they have worked with me and so on and so forth. That does not really work out. If you are really serious, try to think of a long-term project plan. Try to think of how you'll be using this experience for a long-term career goal. If it is short-term career internship, there are many organizations. I think that is most suitable for people who are just looking for getting some industrial exposure. And if you're, uh, you know, subsequent after your undergraduation, if your subsequent career aspiration is to be in the corporate, go for a corporate stint. That will be more helpful. But if you're looking for a career in research and you want to be considered seriously as an applicant when you're trying for an MS or a PhD, try to develop some good papers and for that time is needed. It's not that that can be done in a short duration. A lot of time and commitment is needed. So for the undergraduate students, I would say that for people who are doing their BTEC, you need to think what exactly that you're looking for, whether you're looking for a career in the industry or whether you're looking for a career in research. Based on that, choose how you're approaching. One of the bigger problems is we get huge number of applications. It is almost every day I'll be getting an application for doing an internship. Now, the problem with this application is all of this is almost cut paste. Sometimes they try customizing using Python and send out mailer, and then they will pick up one of my publications, but then with that metadata also comes in. So don't do that. When you do that, it becomes very evident that you have sent out the same email to many people. And uh, while you are scraping these things, information which you, you carved out, that was not really great. So I would suggest that if you're looking for research, then try to identify a person based on genuine interest and you have a genuine interest and you've read that area and you have a commitment of two, three years so that you can do something tangible in that area. So only then at the undergraduate level, research-based internships will work. The other side of it is if it is PhD students, when I'm recruiting PhD students, I look for indications, indications like how serious they have been in their masters. Are there some research papers that they have published? If PhD is a very individual journey, all my PhD students, I'll consider them to be my baby. If I'm considered them, them to be my baby, I want that relation to be nurtured for the rest of four or five years. That commitment I want from them, I will also give them that commitment. But as a result of that, I need to be very sure that they are willing to invest that time and they're ready to invest that time over that next four or five years so that they can bring out some really high quality tangible publications and research output. So for PhD students, what I look for is evidences that they have some past publications during their master's and tech thesis. It might not be very high quality publications, but at least some decent amount of, say, conference paper proceedings in IQT, ACN, in some decent conferences, or maybe a journal, which is, maybe the journal is not good, but then the quality of work, I'll try to evaluate whether how good that is. So those are the kind of things that I look for. Although I know that at the master's level, they'll not have something great, but those are evidences that a sound person is really serious and is willing to invest those four or five years without break, without any kind of other elements into the, TA, the doctoral dissertation. So I just have one final question regarding this. So say our students not having, I mean, if he's, I mean, not belongs to some good grade of college or university is not having that much of resources but still interested to pursue his or her PhD, then how should, uh, I mean, what should be the procedure? So if somebody who is uh, not from a good college, see college is an indication of, uh, you know, capabilities at an early stage of career. It's a proxy measure. It's not a uh, real measure. So what happens is when we choose somebody who has an undergraduation from a good college, whether it is like Jadapur, NITs or IITs, we know that the person has good capability. Capability is one part of it. The other part of it is the, you know, the ability to slug out day in, day out, put in that amount of perspiration that really fructifies. So if somebody is from a good college and institution, that signal is there that that person has been serious about his career. If a person has not had a very good UG level degree, uh, that becomes a little bit of a concern. But if a person demonstrates that at the postgraduate level, the person has been really working hard 
there has to be some evidences of that that he is serious it might have been happened that due to many family circumstances due to other circumstances a person could not crack into the top colleges at the undergrad level but then at the masters level he had that opportunity so he should have been serious at that point of time in terms of grades in terms of maybe doing some small research project which brought out something tangible so that evidence is that somebody will be able to you know kind of deep dive into an area has done some serious thought is not only dependent upon the pedigree of the educational institution but a lot about how he had continued to do that over a period of time some of my best students never have been from you know iits or nits but they have been very hard working and there was demonstration of that hard work over a period of time during their masters degree so i'm looking for those evidences whether a person is serious whether he will be serious after he joins the phd uh, to be very frank a general ability is needed a general aptitude is needed that minimum aptitude is something that has to be there but above that what is really needed is the ability to push slog day in day out for those four five years during the phd to produce something really tangible and beyond that once he graduates he or she should join the you know academic institutions universities and then the remaining 8 10 years how much he invest in building his career that requires a lot of commitment self motivation that drive internally so that is something that i am looking for without that people will not be able to sustain in academia okay thanks professor for having such a nice discussions today and uh, i want to thanks you once again for dedicating your time to our discussions so looking forward to future opportunities for insightful uh, conversations with you once again so have a nice day bye thank you thank you so much sir.